So hi everyone, thank you for joining us today for Daru Khan's first talk. Daru Khan Apotek Pharmacy is an Iranian pharmacy run by Sohrab Karshania and Ayta Razmi and aims to question and to a certain extent reverse pharmaceutical import export logics through a spatial and visual display that, is, that reproduces Iranian medication packages in a German context. Transcultural disconnections, inequalities in distribution, pharma economic power dynamics, trade restrictions, and legal obstacles are some of the topics echoed in the exhibition. Today, artists Bahar Nurizadeh and Yasan Ghali Nuri have joined us to give a presentation following with a conversation between them titled Forms of an Economy. First, I will introduce both artists, and before that, they start their conversation and presentation. I will give you an introduction about their talk. And at the end, we can have a Q&A with the audience. Uh, Bahar Nurizadeh is an artist, writer, and filmmaker. Her research examines the historical advance of speculative activity and is derivative, derivative sorry, with this word, I'm always like this, derivative politics and art, urban life, and finance and philosophy. Nurizadeh is the founder of Weird Economies, an online art platform that traces economic imaginaries, extraordinary to financial arrangements of our time. Her work has appeared at the German Pavilion, Venice Architecture Biennial 2021, Tate Borders Artist Cinema Program, Transmediale Festival, Berlinale Forum Expanded, and Geneva Biennale of Moving Images, among others. Nurizade has contributed essays to Eflux Architecture, Journal of Visual Culture, and forthcoming anthropo uh, sorry, anthologies from Duke University Press and Stern Press. She is pursuing her work as a PhD candidate in art at Goldsmiths University of London, where she holds an SSHRS doctoral fellowship. Yasaman Galenoi holds an MFA in fine art and from Goldsmiths University of London. Currently based between London and Tehran, she researches the possibilities of economic alternatives through collective experiments, non-uniformity and ethics of distribution. So just a brief introduction about their talk. Economy is often taken as inaccessible, yet everyday participation in our various spheres of economic, economic practice is shared and experienced by all ages. Informal economies give insight into this embodied knowledge. What leverage in formality and informal frictions could bring to disciplinary economies? Considering that the artist's subject subjectivity has been formed in direct relation with the entrepreneurial subject of neoliberalism, what can be learned from artists' personal trajectory in navigating the ecology of their field and how can these experiences enrich alternative imaginations of engaging with our economies? And what can artists learn in, in turn from how precarious workers forge otherly forms of shifting alliances in their current uh, predatory labor markets? So now we can start by Yasamin's uh, presentation and then go on with the rest of the program. Um, I can mute myself and Yasamin, you can start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gurmish, and hi to everyone who's um, here today. Uh, I think I'm going to share um, just um, something. Um, if you give me like a few seconds. Yes, that's fine. Um, okay, so. Sorry, I'm having some issues with this document here. Cool. So reflecting on the title, the first thing that came um, to my mind was basically what is an economy? And I know that this is itself a very vague and encompassing question, but I think our relation to the economy is of some sort of an abstract understanding. Um, commonly we perceive it as having power over us or as a natural force or a mystical one having in an accessible and vague structures that can't be easily questioned or redefined in a more accessible form and with an easier language. As many have pointed out, it's become the area of expertise created by the few also gatekept and accessed by those. Um, while in reality, it has a very specific history of where it comes from and how it is developed to what it is now. 
Yeah, the fact is that we all participate in the economy from um, different positions and in different ways. We have our own experiences of it. In a way, I think like we could say that economic, economic knowledge is embodied, whether, whether we want to consciously acknowledge it or not. And this is not to occupy uh, the language of flag bearers of economic knowledge or the few, but to think of it in different terms that correspond to a more diverse set of experiences. I think as a side note, it's really interesting to see that the majority of those who um, teach economics at university or study are white Western men. And that definitely has something to say about the situation we find ourselves in and where we could stand um, in the future, in the present and the future. Um, so thinking about Iran, economic theory is even vaguer um, than the West. It's only recently that I see and hear in public media news channels that they reference no liberal economists or reiterate liberal economic theories and arguments, which didn't seem to be the protocol before, um, like using the metaphors that economy as a cake or deregulation, the discourse of globalization, market competition, etc., like encouraging people to uh, given to neoliberal ideas that wasn't necessarily the case before in Iran. On the other hand, we have all those skeptical and critical of the language, even asking if um, neoliberal is something that we could call our economy. But putting that aside, I think the issue is that this well-rehearsed language and theorization doesn't necessarily give access to those who are the outcasts in our economies. For instance, those who work in the informal sector, or those who lack the leverage that international economic institutions claim to be provided for by them, um, by the market operations, or better be said, uh, the predatory and hostile market relations and realities. I've personally become more focused on informal economies um, doing research in the south of Iran um, from two years ago. But also this was informed by my experience and understanding of the situation uh, we have to deal with in contemporary art and as an art worker. Um, I think it's interesting how informal economies are usually seen as anti-modern animals that um, are problems to formal markets and need to be formed, need to be solved by formalization or technocratic solutions and policies. Yet informal labor is done by greater numbers than even two thirds of workers in the global south. And that's only the data um, by formal censuses. Obviously, uh, there are much more people engaged in informal economies um, that is either like invisible to canonical viewpoints or that they simply meant to be unseen because of the essence of that informal labor, sometimes being illegal. Um, and the thing is that the vastness of informal labor includes reproductive labor, care labor, the labor of workers in the global south, and also the labor that has been um, offshore to global south from the global north. So I think like we can say contrary to how modernization views informal markets um, as something that needs to be eradicated or solved or corrected, these markets are societal constructs that operate in circulation and reciprocity with formal markets. Um, in a way, it could even be said that informal economies are byproducts of projected modern economics, and I guess its failures when applied to different contexts, let's say the global south. So formalization and technocratic solutions imposed by international economic institutions like IMF and WTO, to name a few, fall short in considering the context and also interdependencies of these markets. Um, I try to ask, what do we even mean by formalization? What does that imply for those active in informal markets? This all becomes more interesting considering how informal markets actually benefit states because they lower the costs of states in providing social safety nets, not the other way around. And again, with reference to Iran, we've seen that on multiple occasions, the Ministry of Labor has asked startups or private bodies to work on social issues and come up with solutions for them. Um, simply retreating from core state responsibilities. But the thing is that for increasing numbers of urban and rural workers, informal work is the only possible mode of economic participation, either due to their labor not being considered formal work by um, obviously the tyranny of wage labor and rigid definitions of value, as is the case with reproductive labor and care labor that was um, actually proven to us during the pandemic or the unavailability of formalized opportunities, even if they want to pursue formal employment. For instance, again, in Iran, we already host a high number of informal workers showed by a recent census as being 30, 
1% of Tehran's population living in informal residences on the margins of the city. Um, which again, I think it's not necessarily this official census and data, it's not necessarily the correct number because um, many of those informal um, residences are not even accounted for. Also other research shows that two thirds of the income of Iranians is sourced through non-occupational activities, which also tells us something about the fact that many of those even active in formal sector um, participate in informal economies and markets as they have to, just because like they, could, they couldn't uh, meet ends meet with like formal employment. Um, so in general, the exploitative and extractive st structures of neoliberalism, formalization and development are carried out through the technocratic policies laid down by international or supranational institutions. So formalization, just for the sake of it, and making an economic correction, which we could ask what is a correction and who decides um, how that would be applied to, could be a violent um, process towards those marginalized and contribute to their further precarity. Top-down attempts also reinforces bureaucratization and privatization of asset ownership. And this has been the case with modernization or even imperialism um, when they were applied to different contexts. So this was a very brief intro into what is a very complicated and multifold issue that goes beyond my expertise for sure. Um, because what we call informal economies are not of a singular identity. But I just want to focus on the potential and power that resides and exists in informal economies instead of saying they are bound to failure or that they could only be eliminated to make progress. In this sense, the frictions they cause to instantaneous transactions and identifier of the era of financialization is something to think about. It is usually the case that instead of necessarily occupying rigid positions or predictable ones, as is the case with, let's say, formal unions, um, those active in informal economies form shifting alliances and even methods converging at times of threat, activating their leverage and adopting to their surroundings without being bound to their fellows or set um, agendas. In a way, whereas potentials and protection exist in unions and syndicates to safeguard formal workers' rights, which is great, in informal economies that leverage doesn't exist. Instead, other temporary forms of alliances, actions and assurances, like mutual trust, is in play. And these tra uh, traits come out where common interests are targeted. So it's not like they um, always enchant one um, union or like a simple single identity. Hence, I think the question could be something like, how could this informality and known and shared precarity become a common tool? Is that a question that could only be asked and addressed from a local or small scale vantage point? Or does it realize in decentralized networks? Um, going back to the art sector and connecting this to the arts, um, for me is that there are similarities between informal workers and art workers, freelancers, and those working in the gig economy. Precarity is something that artists usually experience, sometimes even pushing them to quit art altogether. Um, it's also the thing that we all experience in multiplied intensities at times of shock and turmoil, as has been the case during the pandemic. Um, most art workers around me and including me um, are underpaid, are struggling to survive or even finance their work just through their art practice and have a hard time believing the future of it could be any different especially now that um, I think the, the important thing is that now that even the horizon with universities and academia is somewhat unreliable, um, perhaps like degrees would have helped the whole credit economy of the arts, um, help someone in the credit economy of the arts before, but that's also shifting in my opinion. Um, and that would be something that we could even discuss later in this conversation. In my case, uh, coming from doing the MFA, and like thinking about the skill sets that it gave me, but also what it took from me. And in relation to that, I think this is something that we all experience, but we experience it as personal and individual problems, especially for those of us coming from underprivileged backgrounds, uh, migrants, people with disabilities, neurodivergence, to name a few. Um, yet they are definitely systemic and hence should be addressed and changed as so. So in the arts, we have always had questions about unions, what they look like and how they operate, how they could help us or funding structures, because as they are right now, they're quite insufficient and inaccessible anyway. 
Um, but I think what I'm sort of like questioning is that, is there anything we could learn from informal economies and marginalized laborers in the global South, let's say, and the way they operate, that is not necessarily a union. Mostly for me, it's to note the floating positions and alliances that gave certain unpredictability and maybe a better hand to play with to inform us. The positive side to it, not just to be like um, a pessimist, is that there are people, collectives, grassroots that even though operating on a small scale are taking the job and addressing these issues, pushing for a different art ecology. In that sense, they understand the art ecology not as something that needs to be left aside altogether, but as something that needs to transition to just futures marked by equal distribution of resources and access points, obviously. Um, and I think that on that note, I'll pass to Bahar and her experience with this, also the work that they're doing um, that she would share with you further. Thank you. Thanks, Yosami. That, that was great. Uh, so I'm going to share some just like images on the side. And um, so I want to kind of go through a sort of personal trajectory um, of how my interest as an artist with economics and finance uh, began. Um, I can trace it back to 2016 when I was, uh, when I just finished a fellowship at Ashkal Alwan in Beirut. Um, and I was going through some institutional uh, problems with uh, um, around, around the time. And at the same time, a friend of mine who was uh, at the time the director of the HWDP program at Beirut, she was also similarly going through um, institutional troubles. So we kind of joined um, forces to think about um, how we can uh, formalize this mass of, you know, informal practices that consist contemporary art. So this was like really the starting point of questioning um, the economy of art as, you know, as a starting point for myself to think about economics. Um, and the desire was to give a contractual form, as I said, to this informal bundle of practices. And just to emphasize, um, it's not only a self-interested you know, matter for artists and art workers, but really at the core of how contemporary art uh, functions within these regimes of informality, at least something that we are problematizing at the time. I'm just you know, kind of giving you the historical grounds. Um, there's a matter of complicity with um, how capitalization and real estate development uh, and various forms of cultural and critical washing of urban spaces take place through these metrics of informality and lack of definitions and some form of like economic open-endedness that allows, you know, um, um, whenever that's, you know, that openness in cultural terms, you know, is present uh, within the neoliberal regime, it enables a kind of like seeping in of, um, different forms of capitalization to take place. Um, so as any demand for a contractual re relationship would entail, um, the question really was how to engineer social solidarity with artists in a precarious environment um, so that they can use the powers given by their you know, collective formation to resist capital appropriation of their work. Um, which is something that's a matter of, you know, it didn't start with us, obviously, it's, a, you know, it has a long history of um, conversations, debates, uh, you know, around different forms of resistance and thinking about how artists participate in, you know, in what their work is critically, critically um, disassembling, but um, the institutions that their works are, you know, uh, placed within is actually enabling. Um, so, and like I said, there are forms of, you know, histories of unionizing activism in various artistic hubs, but um, our diagnosis uh, was resting on 
you know, our diagnosis of what constitutes the concept of contemporary art as a different paradigm from, you know, the, the, from the art regimes that preceded it, for example, modern art um, is directly linked with why, you know, these forms of unionizing activism might not be, you know, as, uh, let's say, um, enabling or, you know, or um, possible at this time, let's say. Um, so contemporary art has many, you know, uh, before us have pointed out, like both Yasemin and myself have, have been studying with uh, some of the theorists of um, the contemporary art theory criticism, Sohail Malik, who, um, whose thesis is that contemporary art is quite literally the cultural logic of neoliberalism. Um, so it kind of reflects and mirrors what you know, the neoliberal um, economy um, is doing within its market. So it's, you know, it manifests that market, uh, uh, market ideology within culture. And I can um, maybe, you know, go over it in terms of like three concepts. So one is uh, contemporary art is transnational. And to be included in its networks, first you have to be privileged enough to be a global market participant because of this condition of transnationality. Um, so there is, you know, it, it, and on all, each of these terms, basically, there is a kind of like counterpoint of like how it appears as other voice. So contemporary art appears as open and appears as, you know, accessible as, you know, anything goes, any location matters. But when you think about it in terms of its economic formation, um, you actually need points of access to it, which are granted, as Yasamin mentioned, through gatekeeping institutions, through um, visas, you know, citizenship status, um, like, you know, very astronomically um, expensive MFA programs, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's actually, you know, what it appears on the surface doesn't match the underlying um, foundation. The second point is um, the art subject at this point has replaced the art object. And I'm using this uh, phrase uh, from Lane Relia's uh, The Everyday Art World, this replacement of the art, sub art subject um, that comes to replace the art object. Um, and what it means is that the experience that contemporary art offers this audience actually demands traveling bodies and spaces, which is also very ecologically uh, costly, as we know at this point. Um, and these bodies who can, um, you know, it includes these bodies who can travel through these spaces of the biennial, the fair, and it actually necessitates this like performativity of, you know, the art actors who move around the globe, um, even more than the art object that moves around the globe. Um, and that kind of constitutes an experience economy. The third point is, um, which is, you know, um, the third point actually derives from the first two points, which is why um, it, it makes the art market as a, dis, you know, a distinct form of, um, a distinct form from the real markets of goods and services. So the art market becomes distinct and exceptional from the real market of goods and services, but at the same time, it actually becomes an epitome for how the financial markets function because there's like a step, you know, a removal from, you know, the kind of the materiality of the artworks to, towards the performativity, which is, you know, the shift from industrial production to the financial production and the financial modes of subjectivity. Um, and to say it in other words, it's a paradox that, you know, art is absolutely invaluable, but it is priced. This is kind of you know the the exceptionality of its markets that um, the art market is a place where items or you know the um, um, like artworks that technically are invaluable um, they are priced and the price is the other name for when the institutional credit and cultural capital that's attached to the artwork is turned liquid and is turned into numbers and information. 
Um, and this institutional credit, who's the artist's friends and bodies in the art world, uh, it's quite literally the network of friendships and associations um, that we call the prestige economy. And you know, this is what kind of constitutes the moral economy of um, contemporary arts. There are um, factors in it that clearly are not about you know, a kind of like old school understanding of the real market and the real value or um, what's the use value of, of an item. Um, so I, I'm kind of going over this section for a while and I wanna jump into um, other works just to say that these questions that we were trying to raise with the, you know, with the art protocol with um, Ghalia Saadavi, my colleague, um, it stayed um, at the level of a research project and didn't, um, it kind of like um, just, um, provokes like other questions that I carry through my practice in the future. Um, and two spaces that it manifested, um, that it carried, carried um, you know, the, the, that those projects like uh, um, came out of. One was um, block building leverage over creative capitalism, which is another collective project, currently slightly dormant, I have to say, um, admittedly, but, um, it was pursuing like some interesting concepts that for me came out of the you know the protocol project and what we were trying to do with block with five other uh, friends and colleagues um, coming out of the summer academy paul clay uh, that was run by tirdad zolgadra at the time um, um, which he kind of like formulated a very interesting um, residency uh, set up where instead of having this in and out relationship um, with the institution and with Ben, he proposed to have two continuous years and bring back the fellows to um, continually work together towards you know, a collective project. Um, and that meant a lot towards like what came out of like these two years of like uh, back and forth participation. So block was our attempt at addressing exactly how contemporary art um, participates in gentrification and participates in real estate um, development without um, kind of, you know, giving up to the nihilism and, you know, the cynicism of um, these engagements um, or like, you know, um, yeah, like to kind of like constructively trying to, you know, engage as artists with, with these questions. And what we came up with ultimately after two years of conversation was to uh, work towards a, a pedagogical approach um, as in to um, insert the conversation about gentrification and contemporary art to uh, you know, um, art educational institutions from a very kind of uh, preliminary um, years of an artistic development because these are conversations that young artists are not exposed to until it's too late as you know we were thinking we were kind of like becoming um, symptoms of that ourselves as you know millennials of the art world um, so another thing we are trying to address was you know our own conditioning as you know these six people coming from six different parts of the planet um, and finding ways of working together despite the you know the precarity despite the um the um like all the problems that we've addressed with you know um creative industries and you know gig industries how um building like sustainable relationships becomes like quite impossible so what we tried to do was um come up with a modular format so um basically a modular, modular format where each of us would, um, you know, take on um, um, a module or a course, and then we would, you know, bring it to an um, educational institution in a specific location in a way to participate with people on the ground who have been working on these topics and uh, build a conversation and a collaborative environment and include the students and ultimately, allow the students to also offer their modules. So it would become a kind of a, you know, 
um, let's say manual blockchain, manual like, you know, modular blockchain that would grow um, without us kind of like keeping a control over it ultimately. Um, but even that required too much labor, which is why the, the project stayed dormant. Um, can I know how much time I have? Because I think I've lost the, I've lost touch with the clock, Golnush or somebody else. Uh, I think we're okay. Like um, it's been thirty minutes now. And we've thought about like one hour, one hour and a half for the whole thing. So you're fine. Okay, I, I try to finish in 10 minutes though, because. Yeah, I think 10 minutes would be great. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, so at the same time, um, in parallel with blog, some of the research questions that I was thinking about from the art protocol, which is the idea of how do you think about governing or regulating a large scale, um, um, large scale industry like contemporary art um, drove me towards this research, this more of a historical research on um, previous examples and previous case studies of how um, um, people have thought about regulating large scale economies. And, the first one of the first few examples that I landed upon was uh, um, the case of um, cybernetic economics experiments, which uh, two primary examples of it is the one that uh, happened in the Soviet Union around the 60s and the one that happened in Salvador Island is Chile. Um, with like a little bit of difference between each, but uh, essentially, um, the Soviet cybernetics um, projects, um, what, you know, what these scientists are trying to do was to build a network of computers that would um, automate this relationship between local, um, local nodes of the network and the central, centralized you know, um, economic head of the state. Um, and I mean, it's kind of also quite relevant to what's happening at this point with conversations that coming from, uh, you know, the war on Ukraine. Um, like my research has like taught me or like it's, it's what it's exposed to me is that um, any kind of like network arch architecture attempt at the Soviet Union or um, in those socialist states, was always, you know, uh, faced with a lot of um, resistance by different bodies because essentially what it would do was to um, bring down kind of the imperialist tendencies of the state or oppose the imperialist tendencies of the state because all these people wanted to do was to, um, you know, uh, spread out um, resources, responsibilities, and communication across, you know, across this continent-wide land. Um, so apart from that, basically what kind of like people have uh, dubbed these experiments have, um, or like what it's been coined by is called the other internet. Um, because it happened around the same time that the project ARPANET in the uh, United States was taking shape. Um, so it could be an internet that is not in the, you know, in the same way that we use the internet today is in the service of um, capitalist uh, prestige economy recognition and, you know, circulation, uh, but it could be for the large scale regulation of a, you know, of a continent wide state and hopefully like, you know, the planet, that's what the intentions and the ambitions were, which um, again, as usual, didn't quite um, uh, went through. Um, and maybe um, I just wanna finish on very briefly on um, the project that followed uh, after scarcity, which is what I'm uh, engaged with these days um, in my PhD. It's a project called um, weird economies, which some of you might, might be familiar with. If not, I, I, I ask you to uh, join us 
here you can subscribe to the websites um, under the um, home page to receive our newsletters. Um, but basically, Weird Economies is um, something that we've been developing in the past few years with some colleagues and friends. Um, it came out of a desire to kind of try to understand this shift from what we say industrial production towards financial financialization and the terms that financialization actually works with um, and work on that um, intersection or space of art and finance and try to think about art as you know an expanded form of um, you know cultures of creativity and industries of creativity that is not necessarily what we call uh, you know what a professional um, artist is um, through this project so it's a post-disciplinary space for these discussions around economic imaginaries and you know speculative imaginaries um, without you know without uh, kind of um, privileging maybe different states of time so like privileging future to the present or to the past um, and um, it's a, as I say, it's a post-disciplinary space and a lot of people we work with, they're, um, they're having very interesting proposals uh, from you know, different um, fields and disciplines, um, which might not sound artistic, but are you know, politically very um, extremely creative. Um, your Samin's last uh, contribution is actually one of the um, last contributions on the website. You can visit it. And then there's a lexicon, there's a financial lexicon where um, we've been trying to um, rework the glossary of finance as finance. We are trying to understand finance as a social field and um, deprofessionalize its language back to how we understand it, you know, in different social realms, like every kind of term you think about credit, um, you know, derivative, um, economy itself, like all of these are subject to uh, play and to rethinking by, you know, people coming from different experiences, like both um, embodied experiences and disciplinary experiences. Um, and then we have a part called uh, a, a subsection to the website called the fixes, uh, which is um, a kind of a playful way of uh, thinking about uh, possibilities for building the world otherwise uh, in short format. So we ask people to really let their imaginations go wild and imagine their best case scenarios for the future. Um, and I, I can actually leave it at this. I think maybe I spoke a bit too much also. And I guess both of us would be happy to answer any questions or comments. Thank you so much, Yasamin and Bahar. That was really informative. Great. So um, I have. Sorry, my battery is a bit weird today, <laughs> sorry. Um, actually, I have a few questions myself. Maybe I should start. <laughs> but um, I was just thinking um, when you guys talked about, you know, these kind of weird economies, like other regulations that you're thinking about, like creativity, all these different like subjects that you touched upon, uh, within like the platforms that you have, like weird economies where your writings and research and everything is within your practice um, and what you present as artists or uh, maybe somehow a bit curators in a way. Um, or correct me if I'm not, um, saying it correctly. Um, do you have also any kind of like practical solutions, even when you talked about like when it's not too late, you know, to go into the right path and have a more educational view to this. Um, in, 
your everyday life or your professional life? Do you have practical solutions for avoiding the current imposed economic system in a way in the art world? Because if we also think about uh, one factor that um, at one point you said um, that's the paradox between the invaluable and priced and this art market is there, but we also have this market of knowledge in a way. And I feel sometimes that we are also stuck in that market of knowledge in a way. And that is coined by, I think, Isabel Graw, if I'm mistaken. So, yeah, just a bit like practically even thinking about this. What are your views? I'm just curious to know. Yeah, Simon, do you want to go first? Um, if you don't want to go first, I guess. Um, that is really a hard question. I mean, I think like there are different ways to answer to it. Like for me, is the first thing is just me as an art worker. How do I like survive? How do I finance myself? Which I still don't have a reliable like answer to it because I'm still struggling. It's like um, aiming to get funds, getting paid in very, very small amounts, just putting them like together to make something out of it, I guess. But also, like, personally, I think, like, one of the things that I'm doing is to be engaged with those institutions that are trying to do something else, like advocating. Um, I work part time with one. So that's something that I think could be um, could make changes. Then um, the other thing that's more important for me, I'm one of those people who is always thinking of like quitting art altogether, be it for like sports or doing something at least actually about like politics or economics, but not like somewhere in between. But like at the end of the day, I'm like, okay, no, it makes sense. It has something for me to be here. But then given that for me, it's mostly like these projects need to have um, an outcome or maybe some sort of like connection to projects on the ground. And that's what I've been doing in the south of Iran, specifically in a project that I've been doing in um, Hormuz Island. And it's like a long-term project. As Bahar said, these are not the things that you could be sort of like finished with in six months and then get to another location, another island, another rural area. So I think um, that would also like come out with time. And it's interesting because I think like, Time is also um, in a way a gift or something that we are investing and spending with these art projects. And yeah, that's kind of also like important to think about how um, we relate to time or how we can make more time in a way or how we can dedicate more time. But um, yeah, Bahar, what do you think? No, I really agree and I'm trying to put my thoughts together and like not being vague but I'm thinking um, like just maybe something to clarify actually through my personal trajectory I think maybe earlier on with the art protocol and you know blog there's this kind of consideration of how do you reformulate this professional space of like you know working within art institutions um, and people who want to engage with that um, they're primarily coming from the idea of like there is something to you know instrumentalize with the with the you know art institutions rather than thinking that it's essentially you know a political space it's more like it has a bunch of resources that if you actually want to put to use for um, social political practices and social political causes like you, you can you know you can become that um, infiltrating agent to um, take it over. Um, I mean, I still find that position interesting in a way, uh, if someone like, you know, engages with it in an interesting way, like, you know, one of the controversial figures in this realm is uh, Renzo Martens, for example, um, a Dutch artist who's been working on this plantation in Congo for, you know, the past 12, 15 years. Um, and he's very controversial because, you know, he's usually seen as the white savior kind of subject. But I think, I really think he has a very interesting angle on, like Yasami mentioned, you know, the longevity and the long-term engagement with the location and the fact that, 
um, he managed to, um, you know, uh, he and, you know, the, uh, the plantation workers together, they managed to um, take back the land, like a piece of the land that the plantation workers were trying to um, take back. And he did it through like this kind of, uh, you know, infiltrating arts, you know, acting out his like art subjectivity to infiltrate art institutions to return, you know, or reverse the economic cycle back to the plantation. Um, but I think where I am now, which um, like it marks a kind of departure from that kind of practice to like what I'm trying to do with weird economies is I also don't want to have a cynical view on art in general like um, and I feel there's like a you know cynicism when like everything is just like you know boiled down into instrumentalization um, and I really want to understand, you know, where is that philosophically, what's that space of, you know, aesthetics, um, indeterminacy that finance and art both occupy, which is, you know, an anticipatory, speculative, like, you know, um, promissory kind of realm and try to find out what does it mean to do politics from that space. So this would departure from like the instrumentalizing stuff. And just one last thing to that, sorry, it's a long uh, windy, winded up answer, but um, I think uh, again, like where the economies becomes, we've talked about this with Yasami before the talk. For me, it's also a way of um, departuring that idea of like, you know, the professional art world is the only place where we can function. Like it's actually trying to step outside the art world in a real way, engage with people outside of it. And people who have been doing years and years of like thinking through how to have different collective practices, how to have like communal practices. Um, which the art world is really, you know, there's a real poverty of like thinking about these questions within our professional field. And every time people try to address this, like inventing the wheel from scratch. Um, so it, it's, it's an effort to also step outside and like, you know, just take a, you know, um, take some fresh air from what's not like fully institutionalized. I might add something like I totally agree with both of you with Bahar saying about like cynicism and instrumentalization and like when she mentioned being a stock in the market of knowledge like knowledge market which is actually a thing I guess and sometimes I feel like we are so like captured in these relations that we sort of like a stop taking pleasure in art because I um, usually like go back to 10 years ago where I decided to do like an art major and I think for me at that time, it was related to emancipation, like revolution, these ideas. But then, um, especially as soon as I did the MFA, I was like, no, this is a market, um, sort of like a neoliberal market competition more than anything. And I've been reflecting on this last year. And I think like, um, I'm just recently like finding my place to have that pleasure, but not really get trapped into those, um, I guess, like relations, which are really toxic at the same time. And um, on learning other things, we were actually having this conversation yesterday that sometimes it's good for artists to have other courses, like other um, forms of knowledge probably like offered to them so that we can sit at a table and like comfortably speak about other issues than just like um, the art, say like economics or um, other issues that we have. It's just like, why do we need to be so much like, you know, um, facing inwards into what is happening in the arts while we can, as Bahar said as well, um, sort of like get outside of it or find um, other experiences, other things outside this um, contemporary art situation. So that's just um, back to add. Yeah, thank you. And even thinking about what Yasami just said, said at the end, it's very odd for uh, me as well about these talks that we're going to have in Daru Khane because the whole exhibition is about pharmaceuticals and related subjects and putting like your names with, for instance, Dr. Jenob Yan, which is an oncologist from Iran, was something that 
I wasn't used to as well. But thinking about even those questions that as people that we've, um, you know, are professionals or art workers, if you say, um, so we have some different intakes and questions probably from these people that would be very interesting. And these intersections are very rare sometimes, much more, of course, in Iran. And they are having a um, lot of questions that what do we talk about in these talks and what can we say? But there are actually a lot of different subjects that can, you know, that we always think about, but are always stuck into the museums or institutions and only the people who are in the art institutions come and see, but what it's actually, you would talk to each other, everything I think we could change from this, you know, display of curatorial projects to actualizing and talking and just chatting a bit even about the different works and the whole economy and, you know, the world's the same. So we have a lot of common ideas. So. I won't talk too much, just asking others if you want to ask any questions that you're online now with us. If you want to, I think you can unmute yourself and ask a question. I will unmute myself to see if anyone wants to ask. Okay, I don't think they have any questions. Let's Just hope they weren't like too vague for people not to have any questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but actually, just if we're just stopping at this point, I want to just point out one um, something that I think Baha said in her talk when you talked about privileging time and not the future, pr present or past. That was a point that maybe you could talk about a little bit. And if Yasamin also has any kind of uh, idea about that, it was very interesting. And you guys also talked about, you know, long-term projects, thinking about time, and, you know, even narrative from the past, to the present, this kind of stuff, you know, became interesting as well. So mm. if you have any take on that. No, that's a very good point. Um, so, I mean, a very kind of honest answer is, for me, weird economies, the concept of the weird came as a response or trying to kind of pose a critique at uh, science fiction, which usually my work has been framed by. Um, and I mean, there are many forms of science fiction, so it's not like science fiction with capital S, capital F. Um, but primarily what I felt like you know is um, this like new kind of turn and tendency towards like science fictional practices in the art um, there's usually like two trends coming coming out of it one of it is um, more of a let's say like escapist like you know escapist like future oriented you know desire that's kind of like out of touch with you know the present and the past um, or, I mean, this is a bit more complicated, or it's usually, you know, when it becomes about a matter of like uh, science fictioning um, different geographies and like more global southern like geographies, um, it's if you kind of like dissect it, it becomes this like diasporic kind of, you know, fetishizing looks on how technology looks in a different location, which um, is not supposed to look like that. So it kind of has this like essentializing notion of like what technology is in the West. Um, and like it's natural to the location of like, you know, the Western cities. But when you put it like in the, you know, within a desert landscape, uh, it brings up this like ironic kind of effect. That's usually what, you know, these works play by. Um, and of course, this has nothing to do with, for example, Afrofuturism or like more kind of like uh, serious forms of like uh, how uh, futurism has been, you know, taken over by 
um, by uh, the black culture and different kind of politicized cultures, which is a way of taking over your own future and taking over the narrative of your future. Um, so I kind of try to bring in the concept of the weird as something that makes this radical break with, you know, the time linearity of like most sci-fis and how sci-fi is usually taken by the art world. So it's like, you know, trying to destabilize the place of the future and um, try to think about these contingent histories, contingent presents, invisible presents, invisible past, like all these different forms of, you know, realities that are not, you know, existent in our um, everyday, um, you know, let's say, uh, normalized normative imaginaries, for me at least, you know, being placed in like Western institutions. Maybe Yasamin also has something to say to that. And not much, I think like you put it really well. But if I want to add something, it's just that I'm like speaking about informal economies and where I'm actually like focused on these days, I just am really interested in the frictions that we can cause to time. Also like the nonlinearity, but also um, frictions that these informalities, anomalies, that's um, what is like what um, remains outside financialization or modern institutions, probably what is um, there as like this central figure. It exists in art as well, but like outside art, I'm like interested in the idea of friction and how, um, yeah, how that's imposed and how we sort of like make changes, but through um, small steps and those, yeah, very, very small actions. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. So I think we're good with our time. So um, others, the participants, I don't think anyone has any questions and it was a really informative and interesting topic you guys talked about and the conversations were really good. Thank you so much for joining us. This was very thank nice. Thank you so much, for Thank you. Thanks and for thank you for sure. Thank you for the participants as well to join us for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> and um, just letting you know, uh, on the first of April, we're also having a talk with Arjun Ahodurai. If he wants to join as well, we would be glad. Thank you again, Bahar and Yasami. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Take care then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.